Uh, the whole the whole world is coming back here. Post pandemic hair, you say? Post pandemic sideburns. Don't remember uh, them from I, last month. They've been there, but I was a little more clean shaven. Okay, I'm gonna flip a screen. Funny, I'm trying to flip my screen. Hey, Jets. There we go. We have people gathering around, hands in pockets, socializing freely. And after all these years, Mr. Lowe is not tired of taking pictures of Teslas. He's busy with time to day. All right. So, oh, well, excuse me for a moment. And we have our little setup where Grace, Grace can preach to the choir. Maybe we'll get a rendition of Amazing Grace. Kevin, silent and deadly as always. Yep. <laughs> okay, looks like Phil is signed on. Okay, I'm going to uh, see if I can rouse our speakers. Okay. I've tagged our uh, PSC reps, see if they get on. Get on, get on. Any pressing questions from the peanut gallery or issues to add to the agenda? He's on. We just need to get the link. Okay. Pardon me, I'm going to say. You're set up on the on the north side of the building now, right? Yes. <clears throat> oh, and we have this year's flying fickle finger of fate award there too. <laughs> that is <clears throat> the super. Siva trophy yep. that needs to be reawarded, engraved, and passed to the next generation. <clears throat> Still another panel left on it. Okay. I'm going to stop video but not mute while I perform other tasks. Get on because I don't have what network would deprive you so? I'm on AT&T. Well, I So what do we call that property? Is that the letter cap?
You're an awfully quiet crowd out there. That's what happens when everyone's muted. Yeah, the picture from the parking lot's disappeared. I think uh, that um, Alex El Gente has turned off his camera. Okay, here you go again. You can see great togetherness, collaborating, commiserating, congeniality going on. Actually, the camera keeps getting shut off there, uh, uh, Alexa. Hunter. Very good. Facts <laughs> matter. Here we have Tim, Tim Economo, and he's being taunted by a Dodge Road Trek from the corner of the parking lot. Wait, no, no. that's a Chevy van. No. Hey, that's just like my old van. <laughs> <laughs> much newer than my old van. <laughs> Only much newer. Yes, everybody missed a deal on an old new van. They did. I gave it away. Yes. I got yelled at. <laughs> oh, my, the old, my old Dodge van sold on Craigslist. Oh, right, right, right. First guy that came out said, you should have put it on Craigslist for 10 grand. Yeah. Well, don't you want it? Okay. Yeah, I do. Well, folks <laughs> online. <laughs> Our um, Puget Sound Energy folks have not responded to my text messages in the past hour. Um, the late genesis of our Zoom meeting link may have made their presentation a casualty. Uh, I cannot no, say we'll, we will stay tuned name, for that. Hello, everyone. In the everyone. meantime, we will yeah. Hi, my corral name is these cats Tim. and hold a meeting in the awning over here. All right, I'm going to try it. So stay tuned. Hello, I, I can hear you, Jonathan. You can. I'm with PSE. Nice to meet you. Come on, oh, okay. give, us, give us some profile. No, no, but my belly, no. <laughs> Once, for those who missed it earlier. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. Batteries are totally shot and he needs a new battery. This could have been... 10 seconds from any SIVA meeting at any time in the past 30 years. Yeah, this, this is only a total battery. Oh, okay. Not as exciting. Not as exciting. All right. Well, um, at this point, I think uh, I think PSC is not joining us. Hey, so, uh, let's, let's do our here. short business meeting. Uh, John, uh, Jonathan Scherer is the elbow, ready, is, shall we? is hoping to speak. Yes. Hello. I think we have executive <laughs> consensus from the vice president. Okay, well, I hope the vice president also agrees. Come on the... down and let's have a little business meeting. Yeah. Um, we get PSC is here. PSC <laughs> is here. Yep, yeah, it did not launch on the Wi Fi. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay. well, at, at some point, I hope uh, El Presidente yes. can say I how many cars are wrong. out there, but in the meantime, we have PSC is waiting to speak. Okay, people, I am not muted, am I? You can hear me fine. I can hear you fine. PSC is ready we to speak. We have strategic Presidente. backlighting so all meeting attendees can remain anonymous, but some of them are quite recognizable in profile alone. I bet the gentleman with the silver halo and the uh, skeptical body language could be recognized immediately by many of us. Okay, Grace is going to uh, drag in the scragglers and we'll commence a bit of business. Yep. Oh. Mr. Baki, did you see my weekend update? My, no, I'm not. Oh, probably if you responded to something since Saturday, no. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Great. Yes, multiple online identities and three plus hours a day of driving are not compatible with a healthy email life. 
We have an unrecognized individual. Her to stand and be recognized. Sure. Who we got here? I'm Kate Cunningham. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry could, could that, for the benefit of the uh, of the of the Zoom <laughs> attendees, could that name be? Glad to meet you, please? Sean. And I, I, I am Jay. Yes. Greetings, sir. For the Eric, I, we communicated online, but I cannot recall or pronounce your name. Eskelson. Are you Norsk? Oh, yeah. It's not going to so. Okay. We have lots of Norwegians around here. <laughs> All right. Well, okay, we have gone past time for PSC to, to uh, show up, so uh, we will okay. not um, um, we'll proceed Jay, without... PSC has been here for almost 10 minutes. ...charging infrastructure Jay. installations, both home and Jay. commercial, and fleet okay. EV initiatives. Right. In other business, Kent, what is this piece of bling that you have dropped on the uh, table here? That's the uh, perpetual, what do you call it? SEVA yes. I've had for way past my time. Seattle Electric Vehicle Association, super electric vehicle advocate, SEVA SEVA, awarded annually, first in 1981, for those of you who weren't born yet, to Stephen Lowe, and many Ooh, years since. Here, 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 yes, and he's still here. Excellent. Um, and it's Due time to uh, open the floor for nominations and election to be held by the end of our fiscal year, I would think, since we're off of schedule. Hello, Dave Barton. Thank you for joining us. Hello, Pirate Scoob. Thank you for your battery and hotspot. Okay, um, and without our PSC presentation, the next okay, item uh, on the Jay, agenda was. Jay, can you hear me at all? I don't think dun, dun, you dun, can. Dun, 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 dun. Jay? Grace was going to talk about Diwa, was she not? <laughs> I'm Grace here. Being well, quiet. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, this being the microphone, I think you should hold it while <gasps> okay. picking pretty faces right from here. the audience. Yeah. Whoa, whoa, whoa. There we go. Perfect. Okay, Grace. Um, yeah, the uh, uh, Drive Electric Washington is the name of our statewide organization that is uh, was put together about three years ago to try to connect all of the um, other groups uh, that are doing activities around the state and kind of share information amongst each other so we can um, attend events or get ideas for different ways to do advocacy and kind of get us all in the same in the same boat on the same message. Uh, well, they kind of weren't inactive for a while during the pandemic, but um, I think I mentioned a couple months ago that we started meeting again. Um, the boards had a couple of meetings and as I'm um, trying to redefine what the mission of this group is going to be like. So um, it's, it's going to be more a group that uh, does connecting other groups together rather than actually taking on a lot of activities. But one thing that this group feels that it really should be the leader on is trying to set a statewide message for what direction we want EV policy to go. Um, there's so many things on the table right now, for instance, um, you know, charging and one of the big issues that's come up and we've had some discussion about is how much we want to support the hydrogen fueling network. Um, because we're, we're EV advocates, we're kind of all about electricity. Now, hydrogen cars do have electric motors too. Uh, but the, the hydrogen production is so much less efficient. How much money should we putting it, put, be putting into it? But the fact is the legislature did pass legislation this past session saying, hey, we're going to um, put some of that EV money into developing hydrogen fuel in the station. And yes, there's been some discussion about how some uses for hydrogen might be actually more efficient than um, um, that electricity, like for um, uh, big equipment, for instance, or um, aviation. aviation, for instance, yeah. So there, there may be a role for hydrogen, but how much do we want to support or, or advocate against the, the hydrogen? So uh, that's really one of many issues that are out there right now. The state is still working on what they're going to do. So um, do, 
DUA, I guess we're calling it DUA, um, is wanting to put together kind of a position paper, um, just kind of listing what we stand for, what we hope EV advocates throughout the state will stand for. Um, not gonna be easy to get something that everybody's on board with, but we do wanna get people talking and inputting to some kind of a document that we can make sure is ready for next legislative session. So we're gonna be working on that this summer and hopefully hear from a lot of people about what their thoughts are. Um, I'm, I, charging infrastructure is a big one. I think we all wanna see the EV charging infrastructure in the state investing a lot more in that. So I think we can probably agree on stuff like that. Um, the road usage charge is gonna be a big one. Um, we've had a lot of discussion about that too. So I hope that some of the things we've discussed will go into this, what we wanna see. And it's probably gonna be a high level. Yes, we support a road usage charge in theory, but how it's implemented is gonna be the key. So um, we're looking at how to do that. Anyway, hope everyone will participate in that discussion, putting something together, because that I think will give us a much bigger voice when we go and talk to policymakers about um, what people are gonna want, what, what they need to support. Okay, um, thank you. Yeah, yeah, so that's mostly what we're working on right now. With DUA, and uh, for those of you who are not residents of the South, DUA being a group of groups should not be referred to as y'all, but all y'all. I recently heard y'all butchered several times by locals and I had to post a correction. We have with us someone who does not say y'all, Jonathan Harris from PSE. And we would love to hear about your EVSE at PSE. Take it away, John. Hi, good, uh, good evening, everyone. I'm, I'm glad we finally got Jay, Jay on the, and he didn't say anything bad about PSE he is in the meantime. speaking to the online folks. Can you guys hear me? Yes, Jonathan, you are audible. To I am, but am I, am I audible to Jay and his team? <laughs> oh, I think they're connecting up right now. Okay, I'll just, uh, I'll wait a second. I'll maybe sing. I don't have a song in my mind though, hold on. <laughs> maybe Jay would tell us when he's all connected. Yeah, you can always try row, row, row your boat. <laughs> I sing that a lot to my son. <laughs> I have a, a two and a half year old and a five year old. So there's a lot of singing and nursery rhymes that goes on. Are you going to sing in AC or DC? Ah, very typical, John. Nice. I like that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Are you there, Jay? Not quite. We can't hear very well on this end. Are, are you able to proceed? Yeah, can you hear me at all? You're very quiet. Okay, uh, I don't know how I can fix that other than shouting into my microphone. Um, the people might chime in in the chat box whether or not they can hear them online. Everyone can hear online, I think, but, uh, but yeah, there you go, I'm loud online. Okay, we have a good speaker going on, thank you. You good? All right. Hopefully everyone can hear me. My name is Jonathan Harris. I work for Puget Sound Energy. Uh, I am part of our new product development team. And uh, my role in the EV group is to focus on the conversion of fleet uh, and commercial vehicles over to electric uh, with a program that we're working on right now. Um, at this time, we have just submitted our PSE transportation electrification plan. It's our five-year roadmap that outlines a, um, our investment into EVSE. Uh, and that's for public charging, workplace, uh, school, uh, school districts, fleet and commercial, you name it. We're trying to cover all the various places that EVs are starting to be adopted into now. And that plan has been submitted to the Utility Commission here in Washington State and is open, if you go to the Utility Commission website, you'll be able to find the plan, is currently there is an open comment period for that plan. So if you read that 89 pages, I think, of our, our five-year plan going forward and you like what you see, uh, please feel free to write a letter to the Utility Commission and, and support what we're doing there. 
but my my role is to focus on the fleet and commercial users and uh, we're starting to see a lot of our local trucking fleets and our municipal fleets looking to adopt electric vehicles into their into their plans for their replacements of their current gasoline or diesel vehicles going forward. Uh, I think just two weeks ago, uh, King County placed an order for an electric class eight tractor from Kenworth to haul solid waste around our region. So that's obviously great news to be great to see that out on the road. Obviously we've got Amazon uh, adopting electric vehicles. There's a, an electric uh, class six box truck from Lion Electric that they are using from their Kent center now that's moving around the area as well. So if you keep your eyes peeled for a box truck with a blue front fender, uh, then that would be the Lion Electric 6. Um, and so we're starting to see a lot of uh, adoption, a lot of movement in this market. And PSC is trying to position ourselves to be able to support that in the near future. And we have been working through our current programs to open a number of public charging uh, stations. I don't know where, where you all are located, but if you have seen the public charging station in Lacey, that is a PSE public start charging station. And uh, you can use an app that's available uh, via PSE in the green lots to use that public charging uh, station now as well. So. Lots, lots to come. We're working on locations in Renton, in Kirkland, uh, in Kent. So yeah, lots of lots of uh, progress, lots of movement on EVSE installations from PSE. Happy to take questions. I actually, ironically, I'm leaving PSE at the end of the month to go and join Rivian. Uh, might have heard of Rivian. <laughs> uh, so I'm actually moving on from PSE to go and focus on Rivian's build out of electric vehicle charging infrastructure as well. Uh, public sites, sites at, um, at trailheads, at parks, and, and other locations as well. But well, congratulations, to... Jonathan. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm pretty excited to go and join them. Um, oh, happy to take some questions about some of the work we're doing if uh, anyone wants to fire away. Yeah, where uh, can you mention where some of the new charging stations will be? I used the one in Lacey and was very pleased. It's the highest power Chatamo station that I've ever used. I was pulling like over 75 kilowatts. Nice. Yeah, I think so. Kirkland is one that uh, we're working on right now. Bellingham is another. And we also have one um, in Renton as well. So there's a number of them spotted around. And I think if you're a customer of PSE or, or not, you can go to the electric vehicle part of the PSE website. There's a newsletter that PSE sends out on a regular basis. I'm not sure if any of you are getting those already, uh, but that would have news on there as to when our new public stations are available and, and ready for use. Really glad to hear about I that 70 kilowatt uh, Chatamo station. Electrify America friend to all Chatamo drivers has dialed back the power of their paltry few stations from over 70 to 50 kilowatts and 46 the last time I tried. Does PSE have any policy about how many Chatamo stations there will be or power levels? Uh, I don't think we have any policy per se, um, but those are the types of stations we're looking to install for public charging. Uh, so we're looking to mirror what we've done at Lacey at other locations. I didn't catch what was the pricing of the each. Your, oh, as your far as price pricing, structure. We just released a new price structure and I, I am unfortunate I have that to hand. Um, so I can uh, send you guys a link in the chat to where that's online. You guys still there? And uh, I don't remember what the pricing was, but it was reasonable. Like I was a few months ago that I, I used it and it was not extremely high priced. I was, I was fairly pleased. All right, thank you very much, Jonathan. And good luck at Rivian. Please keep in touch with your humble roots in Seattle. I will, I, I'm staying put, so I'm not moving anywhere. <laughs> All right, good. Is Melissa Ann on? 
She is not. I have not seen her. She, Melissa's actually recovering from a, a broken collarbone. So uh, she might be taking it easy this evening. But uh, yeah, I will pass on your regards to her. Sorry, but okay, you thank you very time. much. Yep. Stephen, are you ready to go next? Yep, I can go. Can you hear me? We're ready for you. Yes, you're audible Perfect. online for the online viewers, yes. Okay. So, hello, everybody. Good to see you after a hiatus during COVID, not seeing anybody. I'm happy to see you guys are meeting outside again, and I will look forward to maybe next month coming there and meeting you outside. But since I'm here in my shop, I can show you an actual video update of the big electric truck. Speaking of big, heavy electric trucks, here is a class six electric truck. Um, so right now it's the shop, so I'm getting used to having space back <laughs> and it's outside. And um, we got the truck running. So for those who don't know, it is a um, 1954 GMC body on a 1993 GMC chassis. And right now, unfortunately, the motor is taken out and along with everything else. But, um, Got it running a few weeks ago, and there is a very bad vibration. And I think what it is, is that the flywheel, so it has a five-speed manual transmission. And um, in case you have ever wanted to see how a conversion is done, I have that taken, oops. Whoop, sorry, I accidentally bumped the off switch there on the tablet. So um, this is the electric motor. It's smaller in diameter than the steering wheel and much lighter weight and smaller than the giant 427 seven liter V8 that was in the truck originally. And so you can see the electric motor here. It's the Borg Warner. Um, formerly Delco Remy HVH250 and it's in their housing and um, so then there's a coupler that attaches to the splined shaft on the output of the motor and then it has been machined to fit the flywheel and then the pressure plate and the clutch um, mount to that flywheel and so from the bell housing of the truck back to the rear wheels it looks just like anything else and the transmission in the truck doesn't know that it's an electric motor instead of a gas motor on there now um, and the thing is the giant gasoline v8 with its crankshaft um, probably the flywheel is specifically balanced for that crankshaft. And so it actually is not a neutrally balanced flywheel, but it, it has a built-in imbalance. Well, the electric motor, of course, is very simple. It's not oblong with funny shapes driving all these infernal pistons. And so uh, I think that the vibration is coming from the um, flywheel being imbalanced. So. Frustratingly, I had to take the whole thing apart and uh, at just after getting it running, literally rip everything out underneath the hood. Um, you can see the Reinhardt motor controller and contactors bay for the high voltage stuff here. Um, and so, yeah, I had to take everything out of it and get at the motor and take it all apart. and. Now I will take the flywheel to a machine shop that can uh, hopefully spin balance it and um, make it just 
uh, nicely balanced. And then the only other strange thing is that the motor makes a weird noise, um, like a and so I don't know if that is something uh, from having so much weight hanging off of the shaft, but I was also, I couldn't remember if there was a pilot bearing in the um, flywheel and it turns out there is. So I was happy to see that tonight. So uh, yeah, any other questions? That is that is the status of the truck. Very, very close to running off of the one Tesla pack. And, and um, you're absolutely working. right about that flywheel. They uh, they sometimes put counterweights in the flywheel, and the way the way you tell that is if there is an asymmetry in the bolt holes. If there's only one way that flywheel will fit on the crankshaft, it is counterbalanced. So to to compensate for uh -huh. the pistons, so mm -hmm. machining the flywheel will fix that. No. Mm -hmm. That's not how it works. The symmetry so it only goes on one way. The dynamic balance of the flywheel is done to balance the engine. Usually there's weights or cutouts in the flywheel. If there's not, you have to have that flywheel spun balanced for the motor. I went through that on my dynamometer on the 13 inch uh, brake rotor. Um, at about 1800 uh, RPM, it shakes like hell for about $120. I had it spun balanced at a late local speed shop over here in um, Kitsap, and it could easily run four or 5,000 glass smooth. It's actually relatively cheap and relatively common to do it. If you need any hints and um, pointers, I'll look up who I did it. Um, I worked with him a couple years ago. I was very, very happy. Um, on the Ford, specifically the Mustang you built with me, Steve, we took, the, yep. we took the weights out because we we're using electric motor. That was not a smart idea. The whole thing is you take the flywheel and the motor armature and have it balanced at the shop because they spin it up and check it. And actually spin balancing is one of the things we've almost ignored. And it's extremely important once you start moving more than about three or 4,000 RPM. I'm currently running an engine in one of my rails that's running at 15,200 RPM. And you got to get that one right or you're in trouble. So. Yeah, I remember Rich in that uh, gold Mustang that was a conversion somebody else started that we finished it up. Yep. Same thing. That thing had a terrible level. Yeah, the V6 and we the get, Fords. Had it spin back. The V6 and the Fords of that year had what was called an externally balanced flywheel. When you bought the racing flywheel, they had these little weights they put in it. When you put those weights in it, it was correct for the gasoline engine. We made the assumption we didn't need it. That was a bad assumption. And that's why the Mustang at 5,000 RPM makes some bad noises. If that Mustang ever comes apart, we're gonna balance that and make it good for six or 7,000 which is what the motors are good for. So when we're- One thing I can tell, one thing I can tell everybody on this, and it's crazy, is this flywheel and pressure plate, I mean, if you see uh, wow. my head next to it, <laughs> it wow. is massive. And the combination, I mean, by far, like, let's see, I've got the ring gears sitting around somewhere. Uh, <laughs> To show you don't like need it. it's it's like almost 20 inches in diameter and it weighs with when you have the clutch and the flywheel and the pressure plate all together, they weigh over a hundred pounds. It's awful. <laughs> Crazy. Right. That's why I put an aluminum flywheel in the Mustang. So yep, and here's the front motor uh mount, um, which I made along with Ron's help, uh, Ron Easley there. And we made that just using a drill press uh, like Dave Cloud would. So a <laughs> little shout out to old Dave. You don't need fancy machine shops to do everything. I mean, I had the, the motor coupler and stuff machined at a, at a great machine shop out in Buckley, Washington. But, but the fancy adapter plate, you can do a lot with a drill press and grinder and files and sandpaper.
especially when you don't have money. Get really creative yep. with no money. Uh, any other questions about the, the truck? Or I could go back outside and uh, walk around, show you the Tesla pack and stuff underneath. Let yeah, me, uh, please do a let walk me around. Bring my phone. All right, let me grab my phone so that the internet is, stays closer. I'm using it as a hot spot here. And since I'll go outside, I think that'll help. So, yeah, we've been working with uh, students at the University of Washington for the past uh, two or three quarters now, um, a mechanical engineering team and an electrical engineering team. And so the mechanical engineering team is coming up with, or has, has now come up with a system for the refrigerated box. Um, so total, the truck has three 85 kilowatt hour Tesla packs. One of them is beneath the chassis and the other two go inside the refrigerated box. And uh, the students have worked on a new structure, have engineered a structure that will allow the floor to be above and fit the Tesla boxes. I mean, the Tesla battery packs into the box. So. Currently, the truck is running off of just one 85 kilowatt hour Tesla pack that is mounted underneath the uh, frame. And there's a nice big chrome grill on the front, which is taken out at the moment. Um, but you can then see the radiator, uh, or I should say radiators. There's three radiators total, and there will be a fourth underneath the box because there are four separate cooling systems for the truck. So um i made all of this and these two radiators here's the horns which a funny um little thing is they use more 12 volt power than anything else they draw they're from 1954 and they're loud big truck horns and to make all of the electricity translate into sound waves it took like over 63 amps of 12 volt power <laughs> but they're nice sounding horns um i bet then uh, underneath the hood here, we um, got a reservoir for the um, Reinhardt cooling system, and it uses G48 blue coolant, same as Tesla uses. And then um, there's a reservoir over here for the battery system. If you're a LEAF owner, you may see this looks like a familiar reservoir because I got it from a 2013 Nissan LEAF. Um, it also uses G48 coolant, and that's for the battery circuit. Um, I should maybe get a light. It's darker under here. Um, but I'll show you some of the other stuff where it's lighter, and then I can grab a light. Up here is the DC-DC converter. replaces the alternator, and it's from a Chevy Volt. So... Um, takes the 400 volts from the Tesla battery pack and makes 12 volts to run the headlights and all that stuff. Um, down on the side of the truck here, uh, underneath the door and what will be behind the running board um, are two Marine 200 amp circuit breakers. And so the 12 volt battery is here. So it's a lead acid 12 volt battery and one side goes to ground, the other side positive goes in right into a circuit breaker. And then the output from that Chevy Volt DC-DC converter feeds in also through a circuit breaker. And then the combined outputs of those, they're just put in parallel, goes back up and feeds to the cab. And that feeds the whole 12 volt system. So what it allows you to do is to um, turn off the whole 12 volt system and Put your car in a hibernate mode and i'm going to go grab a, a light i can show you let's see here find the light here
Your video is back on, Stephen. All right. I got a lot now. Go back out to the truck. Okay. So, um, from the breakers there, then the positive for the 12 volts comes up and goes through the firewall here, and the negative does too. All of that stuff is covered in heat shrink and through, wrapped through conduit. And then um, I have it set up such that all of the 12 volt fuses and circuit breakers are all on the inside behind, well, they will be behind a panel, but up on the firewall so that any troubleshooting can all be done in one location for the low voltage fuses. And then the high voltage fuses are in that box I showed you earlier. Um, so inside the cabin here, we've got circuit breakers and fuses for everything. And um, the heater is a 12 volt heater. Um, let's, let's see, right there. And uh, the radio is a modern radio that's designed to look like the old 1954 radio. It's pretty cool. There's a big emergency off button, big red button. There's ever some emergency. Um, the dash ugh, in here. Um, the dash, there's a touch screen that goes right here. And that will show RPM and battery information. I'm using the Andromeda Interfaces um, EVIC display. And so it speaks with CAN bus to the Reinhardt motor controller and uh, other stuff. Then I have a speedometer here, which uh, was custom made to look retro and um, have the right miles per hour and everything I want. And it's GPS based. So um, it doesn't matter what size wheels or the fact that it's got a transmission from a 1993 GMC and the body and stuff from the 1954. Um, and then there's temperature sensors over there, a bunch of toggle switches and things which are put in um, for controlling different things. So we've got a regen disable switch so that um, if it's icy in the winter time and the regen is coming on too strong and causing the wheels to lock up. If there's not a big load of cargo in the box, then the driver can just turn off the regen. Also the clutch pedal turns off the regen as soon as you start to push it in. So you can hear a click as soon as you put the clutch pedal in, uh, made a little bracket for that. And um, that will make shifting easier as well, because otherwise with no load on the motor, as soon as you push the clutch in and the regenerative braking would come on, it would just lock up the motor and it would be kind of rough shifting. So with that disable switch sent to the Reinhardt controller, it'll simply disable it as soon as the driver starts putting the clutch pedal in. Um, there's switches to turn on the cooling fans on the radiator for the battery and the uh, motor. Um, but there's also computer systems set up to watch temperature of the things and automatically do that. But I added redundant switches so that the driver can turn those things on if he or she wants to. Um, what else? Oh, the Tesla battery pack. So, Steve, out here. Yes. Um, I would keep that uh, regen on the clutch close by mm -hmm. because on those old transmissions, sometimes you had to double clutch and sometimes being able to slow the motor down quickly allows you to upshift quicker. Mm. I, on Goldie, you know, you, you're one of the few people here that remembers Goldie, right? Yep. Okay, it was a Fiesta with a, with a solid, uh, with no clutch, solid shaft and a starter generator. And you had to do all sorts of tricks to get it to shift quick. One of which was trying to get the motor to slow down from 8,000 RPM so you could get it into the next gear. And I had it on the shifter, I had the um, field control, which controlled the regen. And you'd blip that real quick and it'd spin the motor down quickly. 
So you, you'd come out of one gear at, at five or 6,000, lift on the throttle, blip the regen and pop it into the next gear. And with practice, it sounded like you're shifting an old two speed rear end. You, with a little practice, it was just a, just a motion, but a lot of crap was happening to do it. So keep that switch close by. I think you'll find it'll be handy if you can use it. All right. Luckily, this is a newer um, transmission. It's not the transmission from the 1954, which was very annoying to shift and you had to double clutch. <laughs> but uh, this transmission is from the 1993. So it's an Eaton Fuller truck transmission and has synchro mesh and good, good stuff. <laughs> but yeah, anyway, we've got that switch. So um, this is a car cover just sitting on the back, but you can see the Tesla pack, the gray. So on the top of a Tesla Model S pack is this um, mystery foam looking blanket, which is like a fire retardant anti-fire blanket. And so that's still on there. I was able to reuse um, all but two of the bolts that Tesla used um, to fasten the truck. And um, I designed and made the um, battery mounting bracket. It's pretty beefy because uh, it's all so huge. <laughs> so the Tesla pack is still in its original form and it, um, it can be replaced by simply dropping it straight down. Um, so if, if it needs to ever be replaced, another Model S pack can be put in. Um, the liquid cooling, uh, the Tesla pack is liquid cooled and they use a very fancy Tesla designed, uh, valve or um, self-sealing coolant ports. So that allowed, that's how they were able to demonstrate swapping a battery pack in a Model S in 90 seconds with their fancy robot. Uh, when you drop the battery pack out, the coolant ports are spring-loaded and have little stops in them, so it stops the leaking. So uh, it's pretty cool. I knew I was able to reuse them, but annoyingly, when the battery pack was lined up underneath the truck frame, um, the coolant ports lined up exactly with the bottom of the C channel of the truck frame. So what I had to do is offset the, um, the battery frame to one side. So it won't really be noticeable once the box is on and the running boards are on, which are what I'm working on this week. So right now they're just tack welded up, but um, I made new mounts here out of angle steel and that's mounted to the side of the C channel to hold the running boards on. So that right now, I mean, being six foot four, I can get up into the truck, but anyone else, it's a pretty big step up to get into this huge truck. So the running boards will help dramatically. Um, the high voltage runs down the driver's side of the vehicle inside the orange conduit. And um, so there's the big, conduit for the main drive uh, high voltage cables, which are two aught. And then there's a smaller one for high voltage accessories like the refrigeration system for the truck. Um, we'll be back in the box. I can see right now with the conduit around, but the, um, right there is the fancy Tesla cooling port. And then I've got the hoses coming out of there and there are temperature sensors so we can um, see the temperature going in and the temperature coming out of the battery pack. And then now that I have the light, I can show you a little more back up under the hood. Um, so here we're looking at the two radiators and the third radiator is taken out, but it's down below. So there's one radiator for the motor because it uses Dexron automatic transmission fluid to cool it. So it has its own cooling system. And so there's a pump that, the pump is from a Tesla. It's the same pump that Nissan used in a Leaf. They're good little pumps. Um, then there's the Reinhardt motor cooling system, which is taken out right now because the Reinhardt is taken out of the motor had to be taken out. And then um, the uh, battery cooling system, it has two of the Tesla pumps for it in series to push enough uh, force through the battery pack. And then that system 
you know, the other components need to always be cooled. So the motor makes heat and it always needs to be cooled. The motor controller makes heat and it always needs to be cooled. The battery pack also makes heat, but sometimes that's good. You know, if it's uh, snowy outside, you want the battery pack to be warm. Um, and so sometimes it needs to be warmed and sometimes it needs to be cooled. So it's different from the other systems in that regard. And so there's a 5,500 watt fluid heater also out of the Tesla Model S, which you can see here. And it's made by Zero Start, interestingly, who um, makes diesel engine block heaters. And so, but this one is rated for 400 volts. So I don't know if they did anything else special inside it, but it's pretty cool. So that came out of one of the wrecked Model S's. And um, then there's a diversion valve from the Model S there. Oh, and you can see where we drilled through the um, frame because something that I have learned from Gero and various electric people, and even Tesla learned this the hard way with the Model S, is you've got to be really careful and think like an air bubble and always have everything in the cooling system designed such that the air bubbles will go to the highest point and bleed out somehow so that you don't get air bubbles caught in the system, making your cooling system less effective. And Tesla did not design the Model S that way, surprisingly. And so what they have to do is use a fancy vacuum and put it on when they're first filling a Tesla pack and filling the car. Um, otherwise, they'll get air bubbles in and we're having trouble on the early Model S cooling them. I learned that from my friend at Tesla. And then I saw it when we were disassembling the Tesla some areas where that happened. So anyway, in order for me to avoid that happening because of the height of the pack and different parts in the system, I wound up having to drill through the frame of the truck, which is, you know, it's like a nine inch C channel because it's a class six truck. So it's huge. But so both of the coolant ports for the battery pack go through or the coolant hoses pass through holes in the frame and then go to where they need to go. That way, they're always slanting upwards from the battery pack so that air bubbles won't get caught inside the battery pack. So yeah, that's, oh, um, also up under the hood here, you can see other systems um, using the power steering pump from Can EV, which I believe is a Toyota MR2 uh, power steering pump. So it's the other big 12 volt thing. So it's over here and, um, <clears throat> The truck incidentally uses a hydro boost brake booster instead of a vacuum brake booster. And so the power steering pump uh, runs the power steering and all the power brakes. And um, now it's a little bit jumbled and a lot less pretty than it was a few days ago since everything is torn out. But uh, the, that system has its reservoir up here and uh, it's, it's pretty powerful. Um, a funny thing is that there is still a vacuum pump, but it's not for the power brakes like it would usually be. It's for the 1954 windshield wipers, which are vacuum powered. <laughs> so um, you can see down here, um, there's a 12 volt vacuum pump from a smart uh, an electric smart car it's the power brake pump for an electric smart car and now it's the power windshield <laughs> vacuum pump for this and then on the steering column where the turn signal and the windshield washer uh switch is from the gmc i just rerouted that to turn on that vacuum pump so then that turns on the um windshield wipers on the truck <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I think that's pretty much all the, the systems. Oh, um, you can see out at the back here um, where I drilled into the Tesla pack. So this is the connection that goes normally to the Tesla, but I made my own extra connection here um, that goes into this little box with a big Gigavac maintenance switch and to a nice Amphenol plug here um, and then that goes up to the front. And so right now I'm running the, I use two out there and just will run the truck off of the one Tesla pack there. 
but ultimately the three Tesla packs will be combined in parallel and um, they will go through a different combiner box. And then the Manzanita microcharger, we're using a PFC 50 on this pack. And so it will be plugged directly into the Tesla battery on the battery side of the Tesla contactors so that the Tesla contactors, if the Tesla BMS opens the contactors, it won't damage the charger. Thank you. So yeah, any other questions? I suppose I probably ought to get your charger, your last one put together, huh, Steve? Yeah. You're going to need it shortly? Mm-hmm. Okay, let's see if I can get you that this month. I'm giving myself a cool. deadline. deadline. All right. Uh, anybody else have any questions? Hey, the peanut have... gallery is sitting dumbfounded. <laughs> no, not not really. How much um, heat do you propose your packs are going to make? I see you spending a lot of effort trying to keep the Tesla packs cool. And with that much battery, unless you're running that drive at its capability, at its maximum limit, you don't have much heat to worry about. You know, it, it, you're, you're. Well, I, I, I hope you're right. Um, I don't know. All, all I do know is that Tesla packs can overheat and they have a smaller radiator, but they also have a uh, refrigerant to fluid heat exchanger so they can actually cool below ambient. Since I don't have that, the best I'll ever be able to do be as cool as ambient. And what's so I am trying. What's your refrigerant what? circuit that you're currently using? What's that for? I'm not, that's what I said. Uh, there will be refrigerant for the truck uh, refrigerated box and I could potentially tap into that and then I'd have to run it up to the front and I'd rather not do that. So I'm planning, I'm trying to plan the cooling system to be beefy enough without having to use refrigerant and tie that into it. But Tesla did. So I, I agree with the three packs working parallel. I hope that it will have an easy life. But on the other hand, the Tesla Model S weighs just shy of 5,000 pounds. And this with a fully loaded box will weigh 26,000 pounds. So uh, hopefully it will not be too bad for the battery, but we'll see. <laughs> as, as I recall, when I tested a, an S module, you could pull up to three or 400 amps and not get much heating at all. And then when you went over a certain amperage number, it really showed up. So with three packs, if you're running, say, 200 amp load out of three packs, you may find you have an awful lot of cooling you don't need. And then on that hot afternoon that you're pulling something up the pass, you may need all you can get. But um, I always thought would be cool is to be able to tap into some other refrigerant system to, to chill them down, kind of like, you know, you're going up the pass. Let's make sure the pack is at 60 degrees when we start instead of... Uh, 80. So you, you pre-cool, you start pulling heat out of it before you make, it makes heat. And um, so anyways, I found you had to cool the batteries, but below a certain current, it was almost not worth your effort. And above a certain current is absolutely required. Well, thank you, Rich. And we have missed you, especially your grand entrance. That was nice effect. How did I do a grand entrance? I just logged in 20 minutes late and started talking. Oh, yeah. Started talking with a big bold no. <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> I've been through some of those problems and I remember the pain and agony. And one of the, the balance trick was we all stayed away from balancing for years because it was too expensive. Turns out it's actually fairly cheap. It's only a couple hundred dollars. And a couple of the shops around here actually enjoy a, a, something out of the ordinary. And it was like J&J &J in, in Port Orchard or something like that. And we had a long talk. I took the stuff down and came back and it was amazing. He said he took a lot of metal out of it. And you could see where he really worked over parts. And it's the difference between shape. Well, I couldn't run my dyno at, at anywhere near the full speed or the speed I needed to absorb. And now that dyno checks every Zillow we make. 
So every Zilla leaving here actually runs a nine inch motor at six, seven, eight hundred amps. And so I just spin it up, warm the shop up. The brake rotor is nice and purple blue. Um, so I'm very happy with doing the homework and figuring out that balancing funny motors and brake stuff is actually kind of cheap and very, very effective. Yes, it is insurance to be out, to be balanced. Um, we are passing the hat now for the SEVA raffle since we have a baker's dozen in person here ready to spend their money. And let's say, uh, just put your bets in my chat box. And I know you're good for it. We'll have to credit you at the next next in-person meeting. Grace Jay, is saying no, no, you, no, no, no. Where's your picture, Jay? Or you... Uh, not got a video link. I am not using video because there's nothing to see here. Yeah, unfortunately, oh, my um, current toy is gasoline powered at the moment, but it's um, it's expected. Well, we have one last item on the agenda, which is an update from Grace on Cultura's activities, legislative and otherwise. All right, I can say goodbye because I got to run. And the raffle stuff. winner wins a miniature Tesla Model 3. Not a pedal car, just a Matchbox Plus size car. Thank you, Stephen. I'm going to leave you on, but I got to go ship something to Australia. So I'm just going to leave this box on. I'll be back up in a couple minutes. Is Grace you go. with us? Okay. Um, I would just want to give. Grace, you muted yourself. Actually, that might have been a wrong button press for me, but um, not sure. Well, so it's, my screen is showing that the Zoom user is muted. Oh, unmute. Have you got me? Yes. Yes, you are okay. now unmuted. Good. Okay, we're talking about Clean Cars 2030 and the fact that it got uh, vetoed by the governor, but Cultura is still planning to push it and try to get the governor to implement it with an executive order. So they've got a strategy that involves several different prongs. First one is getting the sponsors in the legislature and a bunch of lawmakers to sign on to a letter pushing the governor to implement this as an executive order. Um, the second thing is getting the media involved and getting more media attention for it because it did get national attention when the legislature actually passed it. So there's a lot of momentum going for it right now. So getting a lot of media attention to keep that going is in the second part. The third part is getting people involved. That means us. And so a number of different things are being planned. Most, the biggest one is going to be a rally this summer. We're aiming for late July, hopefully on a Saturday at some point, trying to get as many electric vehicles there as possible and some high profile speakers to talk about how uh, Clean Cars 2030 should just go ahead and be implemented by, by the governor with executive order, just like they did in California, except California did 2035. We want to do it sooner than that. Um, so stay tuned because we're going to need a lot of people to get involved and make their voices heard and get their cars out there and show them. So that's what's happening there. And then events. Um, it looks like we're going to start opening up and being able to do events again. So I'm hoping that this rally will be a big one. But um, anything else that's coming up, um, Greenwood is doing a cruise this year, the last Saturday of the month. 
Uh, is anybody working on getting something together for that? Anybody? Uh, I, I am registered for it, but I haven't tried to uh, gather anyone else to join me. Great. Thank you, yeah. Billy. Yeah, um, it's, it's maybe starting, anyone. Yeah, no, it's, it starts from Aurora Square, which is the old Sears parking lot in uh, Shoreline. And that's, that's at noon on Saturday, June 26th. And, and then they leave at two o'clock and they have uh, some concept they're calling a um, virtual drive poker game or something. And you have to look on their website, which I found completely confusing. Okay, well, would love to see if anybody else wants to get in that and maybe get a, some electric cars together in a group. That would be really nice. Um, as far as any other events going on, Drive Electric Week is coming up late September. I'm looking at you, Philip, to see if you know of anything that's happening. No, I, yeah. did, get, I did get a text from uh, Kirkland asking whether you might want to Kirkland's asked. Uh, turn off the other phone. Kirkland's asked if anybody wants to reached out to see if we might want to show up at their August, and I don't know the date. Uh, car show, which sounds like it's going to be a static car show and not a moving one. That's what it sounds like. If it is, I'll bring it back to the club to decide whether we want to do it or not. Okay, that sounds terrific. If anybody else hears of any events where we might be able to participate, I know there's people like me chomping at the bit to get out and do some outreach again, and I'm anxious to have opportunities to do that. So please do keep us informed. Jay, turn it back to you. Um, we're going to do a drawing for raffle tickets here pretty soon. Last call for tickets. We didn't get any online orders, did we? <laughs> okay. Okay. We're, except from the, the Nigerian bet of 10,000, we are closing to online contributions. And Grace is drawing. How much to the winner? How much to the winner? Uh, $4. We have a grand Sports. sum of four. Who else has a microphone on? Okay, are you the Zoom? okay, the drawing stayed in the family, but I think he packed the ballots. Um, I have several orphan EVs looking for homes. If anyone is interested in a very pretty Volkswagen Cabriolet in need of battery pack, a Ford Ranger EV in need of battery pack, a Smith Newton in need of battery pack, or is just seeking a project, please let me know. <clears throat> Jay, did you mean to mute yourself? <clears throat> okay, I'm back. We just concluded the uh, raffle. It was highly cacophonous. An absolute uproar commenced here. I had to mute for a moment. <laughs> If you have any objections to a holy in-person meeting next month, please let us know. In any event, we could just have the Zoom set up as a camera, but as you've no doubt noticed, it's somewhat awkward to do a hybrid meeting. So uh, we're planning on shooting for an in-person meeting in July. In, commence, in, in, in consistency with uh, the governor's executive order that the state opens on June 30th. 
one more thing about the governor's executive order. Um, the Cultura is trying to get organizations to sign on to a, a letter to the governor uh, asking him to implement the order. And um, I have the text of it here, but I'm not going to share, share the whole thing with you right now. I'm gonna email it out. And if there's any objections to SIVA signing on, let us know what you think. But I think we probably want to sign on to this letter along with a lot of other groups that are doing it. That's the phase out of gas cars 2030 goal. Okay, any last items for the good of the order? Thank you all very much. Of course, the Zoomians can mix amongst yourselves for as long as you like. We're going to sign out. Good night, all. Good night. Thank you, in person meeting. Thank you. Well, I will say goodbye from Chicago because it's past my bedtime. Well, thank you for staying on until 10.08 uh, p.m. <laughs>